All right, and welcome to Porkfest 2017. This is the Alt Expo segment. We'll have a talk every day at noon. We'll have one tomorrow on New Libertarianism today and one on Saturday on Health Freedom. And uh, we also have some ongoing uh, discussions afterwards. If you want to spend more time on a topic, we're up in room 18 in the motel, and there's an Alt Expo uh, banner in front of our room. And this is Alt Expo number 25. So the reason we have uh, an Alternatives Expo is that uh, a lot of people believe that what we really need to be working on is creating stu better stuff, you know, alternatives to the mainstream stream system. You can come on up right. Oh, okay. I'm just killing time to you. Gotcha. Let's <laughs> see what's going on now. Um, so, you know, a lot of, I, I like to say that for 25 years in the libertarian movement, I used to just yell at the TV and argue with them and all that and complain about things. And all the libertarian meetings I went to is like an hour of like complaining about things. So it finally hit me one day, we have to create better stuff. That's the short term, but alternatives. And uh, I'll have a little bit to say about that more tomorrow at noon in here. So, but today we've got mesh networking. We used to have a question um, of like, what's going to happen when they unplug the internet? How are we going to communicate? Like the internet's great now, but what if they censor, unplug it, unplug you, sense, you know, whatever. And with the Snowden revelations, everybody, you know, was concerned that stuff like that was going on, but you were called a conspiracy nut sometimes if you actually said that. But mesh networking is a solution where we are the internet. And I'll let all these folks elaborate on it, on it more. This is Ryan Taylor. He's been to the, uh, in Europe, there's a thing called uh, Battle Mesh. And uh, Brian Sovereign has the Sovereign Tech Show, and he talks about mesh networking on there. And Paige has actually worked in the mesh networking industry. So I want to turn it over to these guys. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's a pretty fair introduction. Everybody feel introduced with all that. Um, I do a show that is called Sovereign Tech. Um, you can find that at SovereignTech.com. Uh, but suffice to say, I'm surrounded by two people that are really like knee deep in what we're talking about here with mesh networking, or at least they have been in various points. Um, I think the first thing I want to start off with is talking about what mesh networking isn't, because as I do a tech show, I spend most of my life reading a lot of tech news so you don't have to, uh, because it's really, <laughs> there's a lot of crap to get through. And you'll see the term mesh networking come up a lot these days. But there's an inherent problem with that, is that when you see like a, a lot of companies, like say IBM um, or some others mention mesh networking, usually they're not talking about kind of like what Jack just mentioned about having alternative systems, alternatives to the internets, or to, you know, and I, I mean internets with an actual plural. Uh, usually what they're talking about is connecting to IoT. Does everybody here know what IoT is? Raise your hand. A lot of people know what IoT is. I hope none of you bought into it. Uh, if you did, you can kindly leave, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> Uh, but IoT is the Internet of Things, or what I call the Internet of Targets, or Internet of Things to be hacked. Uh, it is really, you know, in fact, does everybody remember October 21st uh, last year? Does everybody, anybody remember what happened? I, I call that, the, or go ahead, Paige. Well, I was just going to say, too many things happen in technology, so That's you true. might want to just recap because I'll recap things this quick. happen quickly. You got it. So this was what I call the day the internet died, because, because of IoT, because there were millions and millions of new devices, all with IP addresses that connect to the internet, um, and because they were all turned into a giant botnet that was DDoSing uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Services and Amazon servers in general, which a lot of people may not realize, Amazon powers through their servers about 80% of the internet. Um, and so this, this huge botnet was going at, you know, was, was DDoSing, you know, just overflowing uh, Amazon servers and shutting everything down. Certainly a great case for mesh networking. But the problem is, is that, again, most of the time you hear about mesh networking in the news, they're actually referencing using it for these internet of targets, or sorry, internet of things, to be interconnected independently, uh, you know. And so, be careful, I mean, it may seem like when you're reading the news that when you hear about, oh, they're talking about mesh networking, this is happening, this is happening. They're not usually talking about in the way that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, but there are exciting real developments happening as far as mesh networking that would allow us to either circumvent or survive situations like happened on October 21st 
where you know people couldn't access Gmail, they couldn't use Skype, uh, a whole slew of problems. I mean, like really, the internet was down for a huge chunk of the world, uh, and so that's just again one of the reasons that this is so important to talk about. Um, so you will hear like there are you know when you hear this tech news uh, about mesh networking, often they will talk about like various protocols like Weave. Um, like you'll find out, oh, Google's new router has has mesh networking and all that. Again, that's not the kind of mesh networking we're really talking about here. Um, though some of the new developments, I think, certainly are uh, uh, out there. You know, Ryan, I, I, you were at um, uh, Battle Mesh, and if you want to tell people just a little bit about what Battle Mesh is exactly, and then maybe bring up some of the technologies that are coming to fore. Um, but Paige, I don't, do, do you have, actually, before, before I get to Ryan, do you have, like, like, why do you think mesh networking is so important? I mean, you've been really passionate about this for years, you've worked in the industry. Like what, what, what makes mesh networking important to you, to having these alternative infrastructures of interconnectivity? Well, um, I think it's pretty simple. The mesh networking um, and why we need mesh networking kind of mimics the reason why we need alternative infrastructure for everything else. So ISPs basically control access to um, the internet or other computers around the world. Um, and a lot of communities have um, are dependent on a single ISP, or maybe they have like two to choose from. Um, so in the end, it comes down to A, being able to uh, not depend on these centralized corporations that are, you know, extremely dependent on the government and very involved and back and forth, like one of the strongest relationships. Um, and also just to it's also honestly more efficient in a lot of situations so maybe a mesh network isn't the most efficient thing if you're trying to communicate with someone across the world but if you're trying to communicate with someone in your town then it makes a lot more sense to you know talk you know hop to hop through a couple of devices a couple of routers that are in your town and communicate maybe with like a server that's hosted in your town versus um, going all the way to Google and then back to the person that you're sharing with a uh, document with or something like that. So it's just, um, it's a lot more efficient for kind of local communities and it's uh, more resilient for the more global situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ryan, if you want to share any thoughts like that, but then also, you know, Battle Mesh and what's happening there. Yeah, for sure. So um, I definitely agree with what Paige is saying about the, the need for these networks. We all agree with Paige, all of us, all times. every time. Um, and right now there's a lot of development going on with open source hardware and open source software to make sure that this stuff is available to research and build by the communities that are building the networks. Um, this, uh, this includes things like TV white space communication, which allows very low bandwidth, long distance through trees and things. Um, and then on the flip side of that, there's optic communication to use lasers where you have line of sight so that you can bridge streets and rivers um, in urban areas. And then, so one example that I really like, uh, Libra Mesh is a software that you can install on your routers that makes them mesh very easily. Um, Paige and I had the opportunity to do a workshop in Spain with that. Okay, so question on that. Now, this is this can run on any router. Are there very specific models that, that are required for it? Because one of the things we know is that router firmware, router software, uh, is being locked down pretty much by the government. I mean, you know, yeah. by, by a whole little corporatist setup, which is really uh, dastardly. But I mean, so, so what hardware is required to run this? And then you can tell me more about it. Um, well, they have a list of uh, different, like for the firmware. So you basically go to the LibreMesh website and they'll have a list of the different routers that it works on. And you download the one that's built just for that router. Are they typically like older routers? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because of this FCC yeah. lockdown, which right. now the right. European Union is also following up with their own regulations to essentially what, what these regulations are doing is telling the router manufacturers that you can't sell certain features on your router, things like being able to put your own firmware on there, being able to use certain radio frequencies, um, and of course it's for your own protection. Okay, so you have LibreMesh, which allows you to pretty much, I guess in summary, you can take a router, put the software on there, and then everybody in a, you know, in a certain range, certain area, could all connect to this, and then you'd have like your own, yeah, your own little internet, right? Yeah, yeah, and then you can make those little community internets talk to each other, and then you can do local services like message boards, 
um, locally hosted Wikipedia, so you don't have to access the big bad internet to get to these sources. Yeah, there's, I think, yeah, mesh networking is really good for localizing information. Like, a lot of information doesn't really even need to go too far, especially if it's like, you know, a local map of your town or something like that. Maybe other people will um, want to visit that uh, for other reasons, but the main resource will be for that community. So it makes a lot of sense to just host things and not use the global internet and not host things, you know, across the world that most of the people uh, are going to be accessing are within one region. Sure, I'm glad you brought up uh, maps because this is one of the areas that Google will quietly admit that is a problem for them. Google Maps, how many people here use Google Maps? Yeah, okay, yeah, you can all leave again. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, Google Maps is, obviously it's very efficient for what it does. Um, however, there is an area where it's not very efficient and it's ironic, and that is at a local level as well as kind of the software policing itself at a local level. Google has, over the past three years, uh, on four separate occasions had to shut down various features within Google Maps because they recognize that Maps doesn't work very well on a hyper-local level. And people will just start gaming it and like making little maps on it to make it look like the Android's pissing somewhere. I mean, it's really, it's rather humorous when you see it. Uh, but the point being is that, yeah, you know, really people that, that know their community could make far better maps than Google, which has all the money in the world, could even dream of doing. Uh, so I think that that's a, a totally valid use case uh, to go for. And, you know, you just drive into town and you can connect to the local mesh and, and have a much better experience, I think, uh, you know, when you go there. So, I mean, it could be something very benign like that, uh, you know, when you're talking about mesh networking. And even, um, as, you know, we're thinking of examples right now. Um, we've been like, I feel like this has happened every single year, wanting to set up a mesh network for Porkfest the following year. It's kind of a trend that, and it never gets done. But you can imagine some of the really cool things that we would be able to do, like host um, the um, the app that everyone's downloading and probably can't connect to because they don't have that good of service. You just host it on a server that's located on the campground and then everyone's able to access it extremely quickly and you don't need to depend on the global internet or you know setting up a billboard, um, like buying and selling different things or services that you would have to offer while at Porkfest. Um, so just like, oh, yeah. I don't know if, if we want to keep spewing out ideas, but that's, that's the one thing that definitely always comes up uh, <laughs> talking about mesh networks here. Sure, it'd be a great use case, I think, uh, you know, or a uh, test bed. You yeah, know, it is. Try it out and see I think it's works. hard to kind of get going because it's such a temporary thing. So right. it's, it's, you see more in, like people enthusiastic about setting up mesh networks that are based in a specific community that have, you know, a handful of other people that are, they're also enthusiastic about it. So, um, yeah, that's where sure. you see a lot of the thriving kind of community mesh networks that maybe Ryan. Sure, about. absolutely. I mean, Ryan, what other, um, we, you mentioned Libra Mesh. Were there, was there any other interesting technologies kind of coming out of the woodwork now at Battle Mesh? Yeah, um, so a lot of the work is being done. It's all open source, so the, the, the community is very open. So a lot of these projects don't focus on the incentivization of the nodes, on paying people for running their nodes um, and things like that. But now there is more talk happening just at this last battle mesh about how we can use cryptocurrencies um, to essentially monetize your bandwidth, especially if you have a connection to an internet service provider, then you can split off 20% and make that available to the network and get paid some, some uh, micropayments. Right, I remember the Tor project was kind of trying, well, I don't know how official it was, but I they were trying to do- official. What is it? I don't think it was official. Yeah, it wasn't official, but there was the idea of Tor coin, right? Yeah, it's not official. I yeah. think they actually said, we're not affiliated yeah, with this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not really their style, but uh, <laughs> uh, but this there was an idea to incentivize people to set up, uh, you know, Tor exit nodes and, and whatever else and use Tor in general. Um, so that's an interesting prospect. That's something that's coming down the pike. Yeah, uh, it's something that's happening is the incentivization part. Um, and then right now, because mesh networking isn't exactly new technology. Sure. This is something, this is the 10th battle mesh. So people have been working on this tech for a long time. And, um, so right now, a lot of the focus is to get it out of the hands of the developers, out of the hands of these protocol developers and things, and into a more accessible community. 
so that anyone can just go and get the routers. Um, Libra Mesh is working on a, pro on a router called Libra Router, which you can just walk into an area that has a mesh network, and it, it's a promise that they're working with right now that it, they will attach to whatever mesh network. So you don't need to do any special configuration. Um, I think that's where a lot of the holdup with this is right now, is getting it past the developer level and into the hands of people who can actually use it. Right, now, I mean, this we're talking about not just software, but also hardware that literally creates an alternative internet infrastructure. You know, this is getting away even from fiber, things like this, and some of these I'm gonna, I'll bring up. But um, I think you had mentioned to me there was talk of like using solar cells to power these things, because again, you, you have to power this alternative infrastructure. Right, yeah, and that's especially for disaster relief, um, both political and natural disaster relief. So refugee camps, the people need to get in touch with people once they get to where they're going, they need to get in touch with their family, check their email and things. So FryFunk has been setting up um, giant antennas and hooking up their mesh networks to allow this to happen at the um, at the refugee camps, and then likewise with the solar power. When you're in a natural disaster situation, you need not only hardware that runs on very little power, but then you need a constant power supply and a power source. And so they're using solar to do that. And some of these new uh, this new hardware that's coming out actually uh, monitors the the power output so that it can maintain power depending with very little light. And for in situations where they have no no uh, infrastructure at all left. Yeah, I can see that being very beneficial. And it raises to mind uh, one of the projects that's kind of an alternative infrastructure, which is really, at the end of the day, I think what mesh networking comes down to, right? Um, and one that is trying to be more worldwide, but it has maybe the disadvantage of being largely a one-way street. But I'm curious what both of you think about it. We can start with you, Paige. Um, have you heard about Outernet? Are, are you aware of this? If, if not, yes, that's okay. Yes, but, you know... A year or two ago? Yeah, so. okay. How, how many people here have heard of OuterNet? Yep, we got I mean, some I've heard it from your show. That's yeah, <laughs> well, there you go. See, this is why you need to listen to Sovereign Tech, everybody. So anyway, uh, OuterNet is this concept of, I'm sorry, Ryan, have you heard of it? I have heard of it, but not in a while. Okay, no, so, up. all right, well, I'll, I'll bring it up. But OuterNet is this concept of, of satellites that get launched. And uh, they, around the world, they give people, or you can purchase transceivers, which I think they call lanterns. Um, and they kind of put up on satellites literally the best of the web. Um, they put up Wikipedia, they put up all these different things, and you could submit to them uh, uh, you know, what content you want to go up there. Unfortunately, it's sort of a one-way street. Um, I mean, you can submit to OuterNet, the company, you know, uh, what, what you want to go up onto these satellites. And, but the nice thing is, is because it's satellite, this can get received all around the world and with like practically no infrastructure other than the receiver itself. Again, it is kind of a one-way street, but I think that that's an interesting concept as well um, that, that intrigues me just because it's actually happening, it's out there and it's getting people used to consuming information without connecting to uh, a term that I think Ryan might have stolen from me, the big bad internet. Uh, so, yeah, but I totally stole that from you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so, and I think that's very important to do, uh, to get used to using a multitude of these, you know, kind of like Paige mentioned with resiliency, using a multitude yeah. of these different technologies. Go ahead. Yeah, and even thinking about combining these different technologies so that the whole system, like you can even see it as one kind of alternate system. So you don't want to have a completely peer-to-peer -peer network if you're communicating with someone around the world. You need kind of layers of backbone sort of and outer net seems like it could provide and like satellites or just like more long range connections provide a better backbone which allow the kind of closer connection devices so like you know home routers um, that only reach so far um, they can connect to a more powerful router that can you know, receive further, um, send and receive further distances or, you know, connect to the satellite type thing, so. Yeah, I like the sound of that. So effectively you could have, uh, you know, Libra mesh set up on a router. That router could be receiving, uh, like say from a lantern from OuterNet, could be receiving what OuterNet distributes and then that router could create almost that two-way street, but that could still interact with mm -hmm. all of the data that OuterNet is sending, I mean, anywhere in the mountains. I mean, it, it, there's really nothing to stop uh, OuterNet from getting information somewhere, which is really exciting. Um, something that I'm curious if they talked about a lot at Battle Mesh, uh, Bluetooth 5.0, which everybody has a Bluetooth device, or just about everybody has a Bluetooth device with them, which I think is an exciting thing. You've worked in, in this area where Bluetooth was used to create mesh networks too. Um, but Bluetooth 5.0 was specifically looking to do mesh networking. Again, like I said earlier, 
the, the concept, the idea was more for IoT than anything else, but I think it's something that could be taken advantage of um, to have efficient mesh networking done from like just a device that everybody already has as long as there's an app that can take advantage of that. Um, I want to ask you, Ryan, first, I mean, was there any talk about Bluetooth 5.0 at Battle Mesh? No, there really wasn't. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking it's because Battle Mesh is much more like the bleeding edge type stuff. Yeah. And so the idea of getting this industrial grade tech that we can play with now it's just not, it's not just at our disposal at this time. No, I like that attitude, I really do. <laughs> Go um, ahead. And Bluetooth in general is proprietary, right? Right, uh, well, largely, yes. Yeah, so now I you've, assume you've, the battle mesh community would not be interested. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's not chance. much you can do with it, to be honest. Sure, no, I think that's a fair point. But now, I mean, you've been with, with companies and only speak with, about what you're comfortable, uh, you know, mm -hmm. revealing, but um, that have tried to take advantage of Bluetooth to create mesh networking communication networks for, in fact, honestly, they've been, you know, some of these have been communication networks via Bluetooth that uh, you think like FireChat, some others um, that have been used Fire in, in FireChat. <laughs> That's an inside joke, everybody. <laughs> you gotta, uh, I can't help myself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but it's been used in various uh, 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 demonstrations, protests around yeah. the world to much success. I yeah. mean, so, so tell us about this and, and what do you think the viability is right now? Um, so there's this company called Open Garden. I used to work for them mm, four years ago. Um, I spoke about them at my first pork fest here. Um, and they, so they're basically a startup that was trying to create a business around creating a mobile mesh networking application. Um, initially trying to do peer-to-peer -peer internet connections. So you have data received on your phone. You can, it's kind of like tethering basically, but a peer-to-peer -peer setup. Um, you know, being able to transmit the data that you have to other devices around you. Not only mobile phones, but also laptops and um, other internet necessary devices that can install the app. Um, and then they decided, well, the thing is, I think the main problem with the business model was that there wasn't a business model. And um, so it was hard to like get the startup going and the investors got really pissed off, even though they were like really brilliant people developing the software. Um, it's kind of, it's a more difficult um, avenue to consider how you're going to be making money off of it, um, in, like in such a peer to peer system. Um, but they did um, create this application called FireChat, which was used in the Hong Kong process two years ago, mm -hmm. I think. No, three years ago. Yeah, around Three that. years ago. Um, and that was not an internet connectivity app, but it was a simple messaging app, so you could message people that were within Bluetooth distance from you um, and you know, organize that way. So that kind of blew up um, kind of temporarily as apps do. But um, yeah, it's a really, it was a really interesting experience. I honestly don't know what they're doing nowadays, um, but um, it kind of highlights that there's different needs for being able to communicate with people um, in a mesh network setup. So messaging um, or sending files or, you know, Stuff. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I do know, I think this would have been around 2015, kind of the last claims of what FireChat, the comp or, you know, as a, as a technology, as an app, was trying to do. The claim was is that the, uh, they were going to make, they were going to try and make uh, mobile providers, you know, Verizon, uh, AT&T, whoever else, you know, those government organizations, yes, they are. Uh, they were going to make them obsolete. That was the idea, was that FireChat would, would kind of, like, everybody would be using FireChat and it would just work across the board. And I, I get the sense, like I am, knowing what I know of the technology, I think that this sort of idea really is possible. Uh, in fact, I've theorized for a long time that Apple has really been trying to do this themselves to become their, yeah. own, their own little mobile provider because they have within iPhones, they have what's called um, the mobile, or let's see, the multi-peer connectivity framework, yeah. uh, which is this, their own little proprietary protocol. And of course we don't like proprietary, but. Um, but this protocol could effectively connect every iPhone to every other iPhone around the world. And also in recent updates to uh, Mac OS on the desktop, uh, you know, there's this really, really great synergy that they built into between the iPhone 
and you know how easily it can connect, say, to your MacBook or something. So I think this is actually something they really have in mind to do. So kind of expect this stuff to you know become part of the future, in my opinion. Uh, but we also want it to be able to be free, non-proprietary, and able for everybody to take think, advantage of, not just Apple. Do you think they'll open it up? Because they kind of, if they want to do that, they're going to need to be able to connect to other devices. Like they obviously aren't good, assuming that everyone's going to have an Apple device. So if they want to kind of reach that level, they're going to have to make it not proprietary. Well, that's that's a big question because at the same time, I think you have every other company wanting to do the same thing. I mean, one way that like Facebook is trying to create alternative internet infrastructures, not necessarily mesh networking, but similarly, is they have what's called Project Titan, which are these drones, solar powered drones that just transmit internet everywhere they go. Um, also, Google has Project Loon, which is quite loony, it's, but it stands for balloons that will transmit a proprietary 3G signal down to anywhere you know, in the world. Um, so I think, I think every company is kind of trying to do this, and I don't think that they're going to open it up just because they're trying to get everybody into, kind of like you mentioned, the company name Open Garden. They want to do the exact opposite. They want to be a closed garden. Yeah. You know, going yeah. back to the days of AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy, and all that, even though I have some fond memories, certainly of those times, uh, you know, we, we would want things to be open, but it just it may not actually end up being a, you know, a thing, at least not from the, from the big tech giants. Um, so, you know, just a couple other things I want to mention. Lois, Ryan, do you have any comments on anything there? Well, I'm just thinking um, as far as if we're talking about the big corporations and the ISPs and things, yep. something else to keep in mind is that they have the resources to spend way more money on these LTE towers and things. So their internet connections and the communication standard that we get used to is really going to is change pretty dramatically, I think. Um, while you can, at, like at Porkfest, we could be sharing videos to a local mesh network and you don't have to deal with the, the internet service provider speeds and things, but you, can't, you really can't expect LTE connections when you're wandering through a village in Brazil or something and you find a mesh network. You know, I've said this quite a few times at various other talks and conferences, but I mean, boy, if it wasn't for the fact that everybody wants to do video, and I appreciate you video recording this, by the way, My but pleasure. If, if it wasn't for people needing YouTube and video, like all these technologies could already be implemented, done, and like because of the, the communication speeds required and, uh, you know, all of that has already long been here. I mean, you know, think back to like even the days of Usenet and stuff like that. Uh, but people need their video, so, you know, like this stuff's getting figured out at places like Battle Mesh and, and elsewhere. Um, I do want to mention some of the, you know, some of the interesting alternative uh, infrastructure technologies. Again, we're not just using fiber, maybe not even like the traditional router that you can think of. Um, there was a guy, uh, uh, Harold Haas, I believe his name was, and he created, or he was a part of development for Li-Fi, which is literally light fidelity. And it is this concept of just taking LED bulbs and you could transmit data with this LED bulb that could be received by like a solar panel. And then you'd have a laptop connected to a data connection on the solar panel and you have internet. I mean, it's, you know, yes, if you put something in the way of the LED light beam, uh, or whatever would it cut off, uh, but he was actually able to stream video uh, with Li-Fi. So there are, there are these ideas, and that was in 2015, and they, I, I remember at the time he said it'd be two to three years before they could really bring it to market, and unfortunately he was talking about applications for IoT, but my hope is he was just saying IoT to get investors on board or something. Uh, but, but these alternative technologies, things that, that people aren't even, you know, maybe might not even be on the map. I imagine they probably talked about it, Battle Mesh, something like yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. Sure, and okay. uh, to that degree, there's also things like IPFS where you can have a node instead of like if I wanted to watch a YouTube video, I would need to get on YouTube. And then if Brian wanted to watch the same YouTube video, he would have to get it from YouTube. But if I just watched it and it's saved on the local net network, then he can just get it from me. IPFS stands for else. Interplanetary File System, is yes. that correct? Okay, I like that name, it's yeah, very interesting. Yeah. So, uh, um, I just wanted to, I guess, bring it, uh, the point about the Li-Fi is interesting, particularly because, and similarly with the optic, by, uh, optic, um, the laser. laser optics, yeah. Yeah, yeah. laser. Caruza Caruza is the What's name. the name of that project? Caruza. Caruza, right. Yeah, they're out of um, Slovenia. Slovenia, right. Um, so, a lot, a lot of the mesh networking and just like general internet infrastructure is based off of radio, um, and that is very useful for a lot of reasons. But um, optic, 
and laser connections are can be um, very complementary because you know there's not you don't have this problem with interference um, as long as there's a direct connection between the two points. Um, but a lot of kind of you might go into a city or something and experience really horrible internet and you know mesh networking might not even work in a lot of situations because ever like there's too many routers in the same area um, using the same frequency so um, in addition to thinking about different infrastructure thinking about different uh, ways of implementing the infrastructure is really important yeah absolutely like I mean it, I love saying it because it sounds so futuristic but laser internet you just you know you kind of do the dr. evil thing lasers you know it's very exciting uh, so that's a cool idea, and you know, Li-Fi as well. Um, those are really wild. Um, what I mean, anything else that? Well, here, here's a question, and then I do want to get into questions from the audience, and I think there might be some in the audience that probably have some interesting ideas of their own. Um, but like, what? Describe your fantasy world with mesh networking, if you think you can. Uh, um, if, if if you want to think about it, I'll put Ryan in the hot seat. No, no I, I I've uh, been thinking about this. Um, it's like not, every night you think about this, right? Well, I, not every night, <laughs> but um, it's kind of combining. It's kind of combining my two uh, kind of passions right now. So mesh networking, I guess, has like been my passion for a while. Um, but cryptocurrencies are another thing that I have been passionate and not passionate about on and off for many years now. Um, but one thing that I've been thinking is really cool would be really cool is so a huge problem with a cryptocurrency for example like bitcoin or zcash um, is that it's a global network and like what if you can't connect to that global network or get a good connection to um, the nodes in the network what if there was a mechanism to have this kind of um, alter like alternative channels for local currencies so maybe there isn't necessarily like maybe there's this one global currency like zcash um that <laughs> i work for zcash so <laughs> disclaimer um that you know is kind of this clearing house and allows people to settle things uh globally without any central parties but then there's these local currencies that are based off of this main blockchain that are just hosted in local communities so um, you don't need to connect to the greater internet as long as you have some sort of like local authority or so like there's going to be some sort of third party management in these situations but the idea is that you can kind of drastically decentralize money rather than just like trying to create many global currencies having like um, you know Lancaster coin or something. Well, right? I remember like Aurora coin. Aurora, yeah, exactly. Was, but the problem with the yeah. Aurora coin, it was like an Icelandic based coin. Yes. But it was a global cryptocurrency. Why would anyone except people in Iceland be invested in that? Um, unless you were like a speculator and whatnot. But um, so maybe not like maybe not using. Um, mesh network for cryptocurrency, like global cryptocurrencies, but being able to host a local currency on a local mesh network in your town so that, you know, you can just, you know, so things can still say digital and local. Um, yeah, I don't know. No, I love it. The, the idea of, I mean, that's a big part of mesh networking, certainly, and it's a direction I'd love to see cryptocurrencies go in is this relocalization where things can really, you can have, you know, uh, better resiliency, better accuracy, uh, things can get developed to, to tailor more to the needs of an area. Uh, like right here, it'd be really nice to have, you know, a coin that doesn't require constant connection to an internet, uh, you know, however that would end up shaping up uh, because it can be so spotty or, you know, other things. There's, there's lots of different uh, uh, ways that I think you could really Yeah, or even like a token for, Porkfest, right? Like, sure. you know, you trade in your, you pay, when you buy a ticket, you um, pay a little bit extra for these tokens that get sent to your phone, and then you can use those token at vendors, or right. I don't know, just like, there's a lot of things that can happen with cryptocurrencies that isn't necessarily global, however, you know, the back end is a little different looking, it's not like 
the global blockchain that's super secure and everything. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm all for that as long as it's not built on Ethereum. Uh, Ryan Taylor, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that. <laughs> Uh, Ryan, what, what do you got? Get, tell us your wildest uh, fantasies. Here okay, I'm going to go into fantasy land. Yeah, all right. There's all right. A, uh, another project that I just found out about in Argentina, and the name is escaping me at the moment, um, but they're using balloons, that they're creating these balloons or renting um, from nautical companies to get uh, mesh networks or to get internet access out to sea. And they're going like 50 kilometers out and getting a really solid connection with these. So then you can daisy chain those together and then have a man-made floating island with tree houses and have the network going there. You can have your own currency. Um, I would imagine proof of stake would probably be more secure than doing a proof of work in that sort of environment. Yeah, again, this is an area where because it's localized, you could try out different, uh, different proofs, different technologies, what works best for the, the use case. Yeah, 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 so I think that um, that would be kind of my fantasy land network is to be able to spread out to sea and allow people to just start creating their sovereign communities. Or right. undersea. Yeah. Yeah, now, there you go. <laughs> Page read my action. mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so we'll come up with open source submarines. I like this. And, 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 but no, I, I think what you're raising is a great point. I mean, when you think of a lot of the, lot of the projects that are actually looking to maybe find freedom in their life uh, by going out to sea, I mean, there's, there's quite a few of these, or people just trying to get business done to get away from local regulations and whatever, uh, so that they can more efficiently create startups that can maybe create a lot of what we're talking about. Oh yeah, having internet solutions and, and incentivization, cryptocurrency solutions for that, I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, so my fantasies, I, uh, you know, are kind of, um, they put big X's on the rating for them, so I'm not gonna go into those here, uh, but I think what they had to say were fantastic, uh, so I'll say, I'll spare mine. Um, I'd love to, we do have time for questions, I assume. Um, I would love to get into questions, because uh, I imagine, how many people have a question? Let, let, let me, just so I can gauge. Okay, got, got a few people, so good. So I think we can, if anyone else has anything else to say. Uh, let's open it up. Let's open it up. Um, and then, of course, at the end of the questions, I'll let you know how you can follow all three of us, and I recommend following all three of us. In fact, if you've never opened a Twitter account before, it's the first three people you want to follow, trust me. So anyway, um, all right, let's get to questions. We can start, uh, and I'll repeat the question back so we don't have to bring microphones or anything out to you. But uh, yes, please, right there. Um, I just, uh, sorry, right here. I just wanted to know what this battle was. I kind of get the drift, but it would be nice to know more about it. Sure. Okay, so, what is Battle Mesh? That's the question. Yeah, Battle Mesh Give is you an annual event. It's, um, it's decentralized. There's no real organization behind it. Um, it happens every year in a different country in Europe, generally. And it's a gathering of protocol developers, hardware engineers, um, activists, journalists, designers, anyone that's interested in building these community networks and people who are doing it around the world. So there's representation from from Brazil, from Argentina, um, all over Western Europe. We have some people from India coming in and everyone brings their experiences in the field and the projects that they've been working back, uh, working at in their communities in their hometowns. And, and where can they and hacks on things. Sure, where, what's uh, like a website they could go to? to Battlemesh.org. Battlemesh.org, okay. It's also really cool because um, it kind of brings together different communities that are actually building mesh network. So, and they have different methods because there's different protocols that you can use to build a local mesh network. So the battle mesh is essentially, there is, I don't know if they did it this year, but when I went, they actually battled the different routing protocols against each other to see which one would route packets faster and be uh, more efficient in the general routing, various tests, I forget specifically what they were, but it's a kind of a way to um, come to get like these communities that are attempting to implement these things every um, in their local areas to come together and compare notes and, you know, help each other improve because it is like a lot of the mesh networking enthusiasts, enthusiasm is based in these communities. So you find that there's like, um, well, quite frankly, there aren't many in the United States, but there's a ton in Europe. Um, Ryan, you mentioned Freifunk earlier. That's a German-based community. They're all over Germany, but it's essentially, if you see, um, if you go to Berlin or um, Hamburg, I think Hamburg's the biggest. Pretty much any big city. Okay. Yeah. Isn't there one that's like the biggest? 
And Hamburg, Frankfurt probably has okay. great representation too, but Hamburg is definitely very So active. you can go to these cities and perhaps connect to one of their mesh networks. If you like look through your Wi-Fi, you might see Freifunk on there. Um, and that's just one example. They're all over this, you know, um, Austria and um, Yeah, Austria has Greece Funkfeuer, and, and, yeah. um, and in Greece there's several in Athens and outside of the city as well. Um, Vlans, Catalonia. Albania, Catalonia. Yeah. Awesome. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, man in black in the back, go for it. Yeah. So having the means of like having local mesh networks is all fine and good, but that's not worth anything if nothing is self-hosted by these local uh, communities. And it seems that the pervasive trend to cloud computing is having people ditch more and more hardware. Like who even has an always on desktop computer network? Right? So what can we do if we are to create new mesh networks? What do we do to re-incentivize people into having actual hardware within well, that's okay. So the question is, is that, all right, we want to do mesh networking, but we got to have the hardware. We got to have like, you know, multi terabyte hard drives. Is that the like kind of what you're, the hosting yeah. to be able to even power this, to have these mini internets all around the world and all that. That's a very salient point. And in fact, cloud computing, I personally feel has been a real problem because it has held back development on localized technologies, even like, you know, the future development of USB and other things. I mean, fortunately we ended up with USB-C, but that's only because it had been worked on years before cloud computing became a thing. Um, I'll tell you a story, and this is kind of one of the ways I think to get people on board with this stuff, is uh, Amazon Cloud Drive, just two weeks ago, they were offering for $60 a year, they were offering unlimited storage of whatever you wanted to put up there. Why wouldn't you pay for that? That's amazing. You, don't, you never have to buy another hard drive again. You're just gonna pay 60 bucks a month to, to give Amazon everything and you can pull it down easy enough whenever you need to. Um, they, they killed that entire ability of unlimited cloud drive and now you're limited more or less to one terabyte. Uh, Microsoft two years ago did the same thing in what's called OneDrive Gate where they were offering uh, to, one, uh, to Office 365 subscribers, okay, and, and actually, like five people that you want to share it with if you have the one subscription, you get unlimited storage of, uh, you know, cloud storage of whatever you want um, for, and it was only like nine ninety five a month and you got versions of Office. I mean, from a conventional consumer perspective, it's a great deal. Why wouldn't you jump on board with that? Well, inside of a year, not even, they said, okay, no, we're canceling that. We're not going to offer you unlimited storage. And it's not like they just stopped offering because before they offered unlimited storage, they were offering you five terabytes per, per account. They took it all the way down to one terabyte, and no matter what, you could not go past that one terabyte amount. So people need to be told and informed, guess what, the cloud's kind of a lie, at least the cloud by these big corporations, because, the, and I said this recently on my show, Sovereign Tech, I mean, what Amazon giveth, Amazon taketh away. What Microsoft giveth, Microsoft taketh away. Uh, you don't want to rely on these big companies, and we have evidence enough in the past few years to just kind of like let people know, Look, no, jump on board with, with local hardware and you know, host your own clouds. There's great projects like sandstorm.io. Um, there's uh, Synology, which is not open source. Sandstorm.io is, but then there's Synology has uh, NAS, which is network area storage. Uh, very easy to set up, and you could do like everything you could imagine on Google Drive. You could do it right with Synology's own apps on your iOS device or your, you know, your Android device, hopefully. Um, and I mean, it, and you have total control of it. So I agree, it's a problem. We got to re-incentivize people to, to get uh, this local, you know, to get local hardware, more powerful hardware, have it in their home, and all this. But I think when these kind of these stories come out, where these you know tech giants are just taking features away completely from stuff that you were paying for already, and they even claim that you're abusing it, which is crazy because if, if a company tells you it's unlimited and you start storing 70 terabytes up there, that's not abuse. They told you it was unlimited. You know, I mean, it's insane for them to say that. Uh, so I think that's, you, you're right, that's, that's the direction to go, but I think the only thing we do is just educate people on how, you know, this is the only way they're really going to ever have control of their, uh, their data. Uh, Paige, did you have something to say on that? Um, yeah, because hosting data can kind of happen at multiple levels, so you don't even really need to think about hosting your own data or, like, every person having, a, like, that server that they're hosting things for other people in their community. You can even imagine like maybe a few people coming together and like having a community space where they host a server for a local community. Um, or, you know, you a, your block or something has a server where sure. everyone's kind of like pitching in to make sure that that server stays up. So 
Um, I think the kind of radical decentralization where ev literally everyone has a server is probably not gonna pan out. So the more practical way to imagine it is um, like do it, setting the, these things up in a local sense, like maybe even your local library, even though um, you know people might have feelings about state sponsored or city sponsored uh, uh, services like that. They're still a good resource um, for potentially just like using them while they're here. Yeah, well, I mean, and you can even set up privatized, you, you know, versions of that. You I mean, could, absolutely. but the libraries are already there, yeah. so <laughs> and and they have, um, yeah, they they have a lot of the infrastructure. They have internet connections already. They might be inter like they're already kind of community focused. So you might have an easy time of like using that infrastructure that's there for your benefit. Well, and they do sure. have some uh, extra protections as well. Libraries do right with the that's the um, yeah. What's the library the librarian project? Uh, library freedom. The library freedom project. Where yes. They, they yeah. take advantage of the fact that the libraries do, can't. They don't need to disclose their user information. Yeah, yeah which they actually, can't get subpoenaed, which is cool. Right, and uh, libraries are actually taking up that charge. In fact, right in New Hampshire, um, one of the local libraries, and I can tell you it's a very small library, uh, was running a Tor node, and they were told by the DHS to turn it off, and they said, screw you, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it running, and they won. Um, so, and these are also, I know the librarians, I mean, they're not like, uh, you know, participants of the Free State Project or anything. These are people that just kind of get it, that information needs librarians to be out Librarians are um, just kind of like yes. activists, period, because yeah. they're so, like, they're so interested in sharing knowledge and people having access to knowledge that they're activists by default. Maybe they don't call themselves activists, but... Sure, but I think they could easily be natural allies, and they've already proven it in many Agreed. ways. Um, who else? Let's see who we got. Uh, let's go to uh, right there. Uh, are there any global efforts towards standard setting networks? Or is it still sort of very fragmented? It does seem to be very fragmented. Um, like the thing with Battle Mesh is that uh, we actually talked about changing the name this year because it has this this competition vibe, and there's not really much competition going on. But you do have these different protocols. Some of them require a lot of configuration files that even make the tech savvy ones of us kind of get a little bit chills because it's like I don't, really don't want to have to deal with that. So there is an effort to get to some standardized point um, and that's kind of why they, they put these protocols up against each other to figure out what works best for them and what's deployable on a large scale. Isn't sure. there also an IETF working group? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, so um, there is Internet like a societies. kind of official working group with the IETF that's I think they mostly focus on a couple of the protocols in terms of research, but I don't, I, I mean, the IETF takes like a decade to do anything, so you're probably not going to get anywhere soon. Sure. Yeah, I feel like their work is more on the radio side, um, but I, Internet Society okay. has a working group as well uh, for mesh networking now. Yeah, yeah. so uh, let's see. Uh, Standardization Dan, is hard. Dan, we've got, yeah. I've got time for one last question, one last bit of business here. Dan, go ahead. QX was a key K I. How do you spell it? K I W I X. K I W I X. Yeah. Okay. And this is a project that already exists. Um, that uh, makes it easy to host a, a mirror, basically of Wikipedia or help Project Gutenberg or like TED Talks. Like they have all this really cool stuff. In they're all just in one simple to download uh, .zip file. They call it. And uh, so I'm packaging that for Sandstorm, and I'm very close to getting done. And I. I 
see what it would look like and how the user interface would look. Um, and the, the only downside of all this is that the Sandstorm, I, I don't think it's quite ready to be connected to a mesh just because of some DNS issues. Mm -hmm. Like it's probably possible, but it requires some savvy to get that all working. I'm trying to talk to some people who know more about it. Sure. And where, where can people follow? Would it be on Twitter? Sure. I thought, like if they wanted, like if they were interested in this idea of taking sandstorm.io and applying it to mesh networks and like using it also to host a lot of the data that you're talking about. Sure. Well, I mean, I don't talk about it very much on Twitter. Oh, okay. As of yet, but I, I, I will. I mean, I'll, I'll probably make more noise about it like next year for the if I need to. Okay. But All right. Well, you can actually, so perfect. Um, so that's interesting. Sandstorm.io, just really quickly for those that don't know, this is a... Uh, a a software suite, and it is very, it is pretty simple to to install. Um, it runs, it can run on like your home server or something, uh, where it has all of the features, including chat, office software, all the things you kind of imagine they were doing with Google, with a Google account and Google services. A uh, very exciting project that has a lot of development going for it right now. Um, so anyway, I think uh, I think that's it. We could do one more. Did you have anyone else another question? Uh, let's see. Um, we'll go right there. Man in black in the back. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, you know, I have a saying about torrents. Torrents are just like your local library without the, you know, without the state funding. Um, that's really the way to consider torrents. They're just a public library. Uh, I think that's a fantastic idea. Uh, torrents, uh, you know, effectively distributed hash tables. Right now, there are, there are there is software out there. It's actually called RetroShare that I'm a huge fan of. Um, that can be run on a, on a local system and can actually do a lot of, like it can do torrenting effectively, it actually can do VoIP, it can do a lot of these other features uh, you know, that, we're, that we're describing here that you want to be able to do on a separate network. Um, I think that's something worthwhile looking into as well. But yeah, setting stuff up like torrents to where you know, only, only certain amounts of the data is being held on the entire network on, on certain systems. Um, I think that that's a very, very interesting thing to, to keep looking into. Uh, always support torrents. I mean, torrents are just one of the most amazing technologies to ever ever really come into existence. Uh, do we have time for one one quick comment? Okay, one, one quick comment right there. I mentioned torrents. Storage does PHD power the object storage. Storage, right. Yeah, and that, how is that spelled? S T O R J, right? Yeah, S T O R J. S T O R J. So these projects are out there; they're happening. It's very exciting. Uh, all three people here are certainly keeping an eye on them and talking about them and doing what they can to make them happen. Uh, so, Paige, where's the best place for people to uh, to follow you, and why the hell wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, Twitter, I O P T I O, and also just if you want to talk about Zcash. I'm all about that. <laughs> yeah, I am all about Zcash myself. I don't work for Anonymous them, cryptocurrency. Them. Yeah, this Zcash is another one of those very exciting technologies uh, that I've been tracking, honestly, since like 2013 when the, when the first paper for Zero Knowledge Proofs came out. Uh, so really exciting stuff to keep an eye on. So that's at iOptio. Uh, Mr. Taylor, Ryan Taylor, where do they find you and follow you? Um, on Twitter and on YouTube, it's adjleak, A-D-J-Y-L-E-A-K. Fantastic. And um, if you look on YouTube for Battle Mesh, then you'll probably just find all the videos that I've posted and fit through that my channel. So. One of the best videographers in the world, and I, oh, I don't just much. say that because he's recording my talk either. As uh, I'm ruining this recording right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, of course, if you want to follow me, you can just f on Twitter, at Sovereign Tech. It's spelled like my last name, S-O-V-R-Y-N, and then just tech. Um, or you can go to zog.email. That's my website. You can actually sign up for my newsletter um, where I update everything that's going on. In fact, actually, I have a book coming out tomorrow uh, that is going to try and get everybody on board. Uh, it has to do with my dark Android project. Uh, thank you. And <laughs> um, that'll hopefully get people on board with at least wanting to encrypt everything before we can get them on mesh networks. So, uh, But yeah, just zog.email if you want to find everything about me. So anyway, uh, Paige, Ryan, thank you so much. Jack, thank you. You and have a thank talk you tomorrow. To I have a, yes, Shout also, I, if you want to catch that, I do have a talk tomorrow. And a workshop. And a workshop that Paige will be a part of. I don't know if, if Mr. Uh, Mr. Taylor I'll will be around. Be. Okay. Uh, but I have a talk at uh, 3 p.m. in the main pavilion. Can you believe they gave that to me? I can't. Uh, they're crazy. So anyway, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Great audience, great questions.